Hi, my name is David Bowes. I am the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center, and this is Washington Policy on the Go. Every week during the legislative session, we come to you with our center directors uh, to give you an update on key legislation, key policy points, provide you new analysis, and basically what you need to know about what's happening in Olympia. While people are uh, logging in to the Zoom webinar, I want to remind you that if you have a question at any point uh, during the presentation, enter it into the Q&A box, should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll try and incorporate every question that we get into, uh, into the presentation so that all questions are answered. If for some reason the question hits you after the program, uh, all of our contact information is at WashingtonPolicy.org. Very easy to contact center directors and ask that question directly if you so choose. Uh, so uh, just be aware of that, or you can email me uh, after the show, and I'll make sure you get your question answered as well. Uh, also, don't forget to check out our blog at WashingtonPolicy.org. The website for Washington Policy Center always has great information, great stuff, and um, and you'll be able to see. Um, you'll be able okay. to see what's happening in real time there as Great. well. So uh, I see here, <laughs> here's some, somebody's hot, that's okay. Um, and, and then I wanted to remind you too, there's a great new blog by uh, a post by Todd Myers, our Center for the Environment Director uh, on the, you know, with, with Earth Day coming up and a lot of emphasis on environmental goals and uh, new climate change reports. Uh, Todd points out that while the governor is calling for state leadership, uh, he points out that the state has failed on their environmental goals time and again, and uh, and even one of the more recent mandates regarding electric vehicles is being ignored, so be sure to check out that blog from Todd. And Jason Mercier, our Center for Government Reform Director, has a new, uh, a new blog that details uh, the forecast uh, budget numbers and uh, basically, it's making the case that while the revenue uh, forecasts are down, it's still a massive increase for the state. So, you know, a, a reduction in the increase is not the same as a reduction. Um, although, you know, with government, sometimes with if people are expecting, you know, amount X and they get slightly less, that can be considered a, a cut or bare bones. And it's really not. So uh, check out Jason's work there. Um, and you know, I'm sure I'll be hearing more uh, from Jason as uh, as the budget debates continue in Olympia. Right now, though, I want to turn to our Center for Education Director Lee Finna, who's been involved in obviously the world of education, which has been uh, a, a big issue in this sure. legislative session. And one of the key uh, parts of this, Lee, we've covered on the show before. In fact, when I first saw your your latest blog, my eyes glanced over it because I thought it was I thought I was yeah. just seeing an older page and then I realized wait no this is new and I thought this had gone away this is regarding the effort to reduce the number of hours of classroom instruction uh, for students why don't you give us you know just a, a brief overview of, of what this bill is and where it's at well, yes, that bill is Senate Bill 5054, which would reduce the instruction time that students get by four hours a week. That bill passed the state Senate on party lines. All Democrats voted for it. All Republicans voted against it. It is now going to be considered by the House. And uh, this, as I wrote in my most, re I've been testifying against it all the way through, as I uh, wrote in my most recent blog, um, this is the second effort of the union to cut instruction time. Last year, remember, they tried to cut instruction time by 20%, and uh, that, was, that was defeated by the outcry from parents and the public, and this time they want to cut instruction time by 13%. So I was listening to the House, so I wrote a little piece on what I heard in the House Education Committee on when I testified against this and was dismayed. I'm afraid they're going to pass this bill. So that's what's happening there. So, you know, how much? I mean, maybe you don't know this, but it's um, it reminds me of, of of a friend of mine who, you know, when I graduated from high school, which is a very long time ago now, um, he was starting his teaching career and they had one half day, you know, and and I spoke with him a few years back and he was saying that it was now. I think 42 or 43 half days in that district. So he, his complaint was that he couldn't get momentum going in class because there was always a half day and, and it just, it's never the same teaching in, in a half day. So um, do we know how much uh, there's, how much pro, um, uh, reduction in class time instruction has taken place over the last 
several years or decades or, or so. I mean, it seems like it's it's been a steady creep. We need we actually need a new metric. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. We need a new metric that uh, defines uh, consistent classroom instruction time because it's cons it's consistently being interrupted, as your friend said. Half days have become regular feature of the public education system. Now, districts across Washington state have early release Wednesdays or late start Mondays. And that just started about 10 years ago and it spread like wildfire. And now they're trying to get more. So any, any serious teacher knows that rep repetition uh, is necessary. Consistent uh, time spent on task is what helps students learn. But if you keep interrupting what they're doing, uh, the children do not progress like they should. So it is, it, you know, time spent on task is a key element of an effective uh, school system. And private schools don't interrupt uh, education with half days all the time. Uh, public charter schools don't do that either. They are, they have consistent five-day weeks and even additional days of instruction. So every, every educator knows that time spent on tasks is key to learning. It's just common sense. It's it's uh, the union trying to get uh, something for uh, you know for itself. So the you know for this latest bill, a reduction of thirteen percent in instructional hours with the teacher. Um, I know the other side is saying, well, this isn't a reduction because we're still having somebody in class and they're going to you know be, be instructing, but it's a reduction of time with the teacher. So um, of of thirteen percent. So the next step has it's passed its its house committee, and so the next step would be house rules, and then to the floor. Is that how that works, or, well, or do we? Know? It should be. It should. It's an executive session on the twenty third, two days from now, in the house committee. Yeah. In the house education committee, it will be. Uh, it's on the calendar for being exec out of that committee, uh, and then it'll go to rules, and then there'll be a vote on the house floor. Wow, that's what'll yeah. happen. Mm -hmm. and, and and do you get the sense that people that parents are uh, feeling the same way they did a couple of uh, what was it last year when oh. there was the effort for the I mean maybe they're just doing it incrementally well we tried for you know over 20 percent <laughs> last time so let's cut that in half we'll go 13 percent and then we'll follow it up with 13 percent maybe in two years again um, well they, the parents are just as mad as they were last time you know yeah. <laughs> especially uh, it, there was there was uh information that there were something like 1,100 people that signed up in opposition to the bill and about 10 for it. Okay, so the, the public showed up in opposite, strong opposition to this bill. Uh, we'll see if they're listening. Okay. We'll see if they're listening. Well, real quick, uh, because this is, I know this has been a, a very passionate issue for you, which has been the need to make up for the COVID learning loss with um, tutoring. And uh, and I, I noticed in the paper today I got an update from a legislature. I'm not sure, a legislator. I'm not sure which one uh, offhand, but uh, the point was that they were that their their local school district seemed unaware that there's this federal money sitting with the superintendent of public instructions office, and and they were wondering why this wasn't applied to to students for for learning loss. Um, you know wh where are we on that issue, and and are you seeing any? Uh, any movement when it comes to um, providing uh, that kind of, of individualized instruction for students who lost that time? Yeah, so I have heard that well, th this week on Thursday, the Senate will uh, publish, publish, will release the state budget uh, proposal from the se state Senate. And I am hopeful that there will be a large sum of money provided in that budget to provide students individual intensive tutoring or extended learning, uh, you know, after school to, uh, help, small group help so they can catch up from their pandemic learning loss. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, we have written extensively about the damage from the pandemic school, you know, from the, the, the COVID school shutdowns, how this has harmed students. And I'm hoping that the legislature will take up uh, the effort to Comp to provide, you know, a remedy to compensate for this to students. You know, the whole thing is mired in bureaucratic uh, obfuscation, all right? I don't know how to say it <laughs> because the, the state received $2.8 billion in COVID federal relief funds in three separate waves and 20%, I think it was 20% was supposed to be earmarked for providing individual tutoring to help students uh, recover from their learning loss. The federal government recognized this. But Washington State has failed to track the, how that money was spent. So we don't know where that money went. I suspect it went to pay raises. It didn't, 
and, and, and legislators are angry with the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction for not having uh, created a system to find out where that money, how that money was spent by districts. He just dispersed it. So all we know is, is that, that uh, there was no special accounting system created to follow those federal funds. So we don't know how it was spent. So this is, this is uh, the legend, the lawmakers are mad about that. And that is why I think that they are going to find money in the budget to provide individual tutoring. The question will be, will there be some real safeguards to make sure that that money, it will be distributed to districts, assuming there's a large amount provided in the budget sufficient to do something, you know, tangible and help something, help enough children learn Assuming there is that, will there be safeguards to make sure that districts spend the money on, on that purpose? Anyway, we'll see. Real quick question for you from an attendee who wants to know if they decrease uh, time in class by 13%, does, does that coincide with any kind of, of uh, pay decrease? Is that oh, a cost-saving measure? Great question. That's a great question, Grace, because this, you know, the state defines the number of instructional hours uh, that teachers are supposed to provide to students. It's around a thousand hours a year, okay? And all of those hours are tied to collective bargaining agreements that contracts that we, that the local districts sign uh, to, to pay teachers on this 180 day, a thousand hours a year contracts. But no such effort is being given to give uh, taxpayers a credit uh, because what they're doing instead is they're redefining the term instructional hour to include time spent with a non-teacher. I'll say that again. So in order to avoid giving taxpayers a reduction, uh, the money we provide to pay teachers and allowing teachers to leave the classroom four hours a week, uh, instead, non-teachers will be spending time with students and they're redefining instructional hours to allow uh, students to be essentially babysat by non-teachers for those four hours a week. That's how they're doing it. Well, it's amazing. I know uh, this is always a stressful time of year while you're trying to keep track of all the, the other things yeah. going on in the legislature, because uh, there's always a lot um, a lot of proposals. Yeah. Uh, now it's it's narrowing down a little bit, so you can kind of see yeah. what the what the map is. But You're right. Uh, but I, I appreciate you taking the time uh, and, well, and joining. Thank me. you. I'm sorry to sound so stressed, but this this is kind of a stressful week, and I'm hoping. I mean, if if I contrast, in the state of New Mexico, which is led by Democrats, has decided to increase the number of instructional hours provided to their students in order to help the students recover from pandemic learning loss. Yet here in Washington State. Uh, we're reducing the number of hours on the on the heels of COVID. That is, is an incredible statement about. So so we'll see what happens with the state budget. Uh, maybe there'll be enough money to help the kids catch up. We'll see. It's like somebody at OSBI. I just saw you know a master class from, offered by TikTok on how long kids should stay in class. You know, yeah. And I mean, just re reduce it. <laughs> anyway, little it's a terrible. Uh, yeah, okay. Little, little dark humor for me. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Lee. Appreciate appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Right, let's, th thank you. Let's go to uh, Pam Lewison. She is our Center for Agriculture Director. Pam, I, I saw a blog that you did this week that was interesting to me about the uh, the so-called buffer bill. This isn't the the most recent buffer bill that we you know had some hopes for because it it was uh, it seemed to be taking um, you know a a, a a compromise approach that was making, you know, that that was, took a lot of hard work where tribal governments and farmers and ranchers and government officials all seemed fairly happy with it, except for the governor. Um, and that tanked that proposal. This was your public records proposal regarding previous iterations of that. And one of the things that you point out is, is there was, there was public statements made that all stakeholders were approached multiple times to try to work out, you know, what this buffer bill would look like. And uh, from what you've gathered so far, that doesn't look to be the case. Why don't you walk us through what you've learned so far on that? So I wanted to do a public records request just to see what uh, the governor's office was doing. Um, you know, his, his buffer bills um, have been, you know, governor requests all the way around. Um, and last year, it was a hard go to, to um, 
dissuade folks from supporting them. And I think this year we're real fortunate to have uh, Representative Chapman uh, say, you know, hey, I'm not gonna pass anything out of my committee that is not bipartisan and supported by the people that are gonna be affected by it. Um, that in turn caused some uh, hurt feelings maybe from the governor's office. And so um, I wanted to just see maybe what what the thought process was and what it looked like. And we had been told um, time and again, you know, we, we reached out to everybody. We reached out to farmers, we reached out to the tribes, we reached out to business entities and those sorts of things. Um, I felt like particularly during the first round of iterations of the buffer bill that that wasn't the case. Because if you read the buffer bill uh, 1838 from uh, last year, what you'll find is uh, the only people who are really going to suffer any consequences were people who lived in rural and agricultural communities. So if rural and agricultural communities are bearing the burden of salmon recovery entirely on their own uh, and at their own expense, I might add, were they really asked about what they thought of it? Um, and in the 251 calendar notifications that I got, uh, in this first batch of my request, there were only two that were very obviously from ag representation, um, which uh, seems like not a lot <laughs> compared to 251 total. So, uh, you know, I would argue that um, while ag is, you know, effectively 1% of the population in Washington state, um, we need to have more than 1% of the voice in a discussion that's going to take away huge swaths of land that's currently in food production. Yeah, first thing I thought of was, it'd be like, you know, you go to the doctor's office, you're in a waiting room with a bunch of people, and the doctor comes in and asks everybody else what they should do to you, <laughs> you know, because we're going to set the rules for you, even though you're the one who's impacted. It doesn't, doesn't quite uh, ring fair. And you're waiting for additional documents on this particular uh, issue, aren't you? So more yeah. could be revealed. Uh, I, I was promised additional documents earlier or early this summer. So uh, I'm curious to know what else will come out of that. Um, you know, the first batch was uh, almost 3,000 records that I combed through um, regarding everything from <clears throat> the Lower Snake River dams uh, to buffers for salmon habitat uh, and other requests that had, you know, the keywords that I asked for. Yeah, well, it's, um, it'll be interesting to see how that pans out and, and if anything, you know, comes to light. I mean, all kidding aside, it's, it's difficult if, uh, if government's going to come along and say, hey, you know, we need to set policy for this, this area, and then they're not interested in the perspective of that area. I mean, I, I can't imagine that happening. Well, maybe it does. I mean, uh, at least it, it has in Seattle, I know, with, with high tech and other industries where, you know, you've got people coming along and just assuming that that they know what's best and not paying attention to what, you know, or what the what the unique challenges are to that aspect of life, whether it's there, the tech industry or you know, who knows, uh, maybe it's restaurants. We've had lots of that in the post-COVID era too, where some restaurants got uh, early bailout money, others were promised and it was never delivered. And, you know, and yet they're competing with people who are made whole. I mean, it's all kinds of crazy things um, that have happened. Um, I, I hate to sound cynical, but I think that agriculture at this point is uh, getting used to uh, having policy made for them without being asked. Yeah, and that's a, that's a danger because you also don't want the mindset of, hey, this is the way it is, you know, because you want to be able to say, hey, wait, that's not how it should be. And there's got to be a way to to appeal, because I think most people, if they take a step back and think about that kind of perspective, they'll go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But, you know, look, <laughs> when you, you know, when people don't think about where their food's from. In fact, this brings me to my next topic with you, which is National Ag Day, how Washington State fits in with that, because you know, I bet you if we did a man on the street and, and interviewed people about, you know, Washington's top economic engines, I think a lot of people on the West Side anyway would not include agriculture in the top five. And uh, and yet, you know, it's it's in you know the top three or four and has been for a long time. So, you know, uh, part of the part of what you wrote about was a, a new branding effort on the part of Washington State. What's that going to look like? So uh, there's a bill uh, that was 
voted unanimously out of uh, the House Ag Exec Committee last week that would um, recreate the Washington Grown program. So uh, Washington Grown was phased out in 2018 because they just had some uh, glitches with the program in general. So this reimagines um, a local branding program that allows uh, farmers and ranchers to apply for clearance to be able to market their products as Washington grown, something that's local. Um, and I, I thought it was really timely given that today is National Ag Day and it's National Ag Week to talk about that because Washington, uh, you know, we're a relatively small state in terms of physical land area, uh, but we compete with states like Texas and California in food production. And so when you look at what we do as a state and what we provide, um, we are sort of doing ourselves a disservice, I think, by not having a Washington grown uh, branding program already in place. In fact, we're one of only five states to not have a branding program. And it's very successful in other parts of the country. Uh, a dear friend of mine lives in Georgia um, and Vidalia onions can only be grown in Vidalia, Georgia because they are a very specific branded product. You can see something like that happening in Washington where maybe you know we come up with some way to um, sort of trademark Cosmic Crisp, the apple, as being a Washington product or, or very specific to Washington. And that gives you a leg up in marketing when you're talking about a global scale. Um, and we as a, a state are a huge contributor to the global market in uh, the things that we lead in production. And that includes apples, sweet cherries, hops, those sorts of things that are known around the world. And we out potato Idaho, which is, uh, you know, everybody knows Idaho potatoes, but come on. Yeah, know, my, my county grows more potatoes per acre per capita than, than anywhere else in the country. So I'm, I am always delighted to let people know that I'm from real potato country. Yeah, I enjoy that most with people from Idaho, but uh, but it's it's just fun all the way around. Um, but you're right. I mean, we lead in a lot of agricultural products. It's a huge part of of our state's economy. Um, you know, it's unfortunate with with the the disconnect between urban and rural. I think there's you know there's fewer and fewer fewer people who've had those kinds of rural agricultural experiences when they're younger, even if that's not their industry. That you know that might give them uh, an an added appreciation of of the, uh, you know what what harvest time means and and the the uh, the small windows of time where everything has to happen uh, for this kind of of industry but um but yeah i think the the branding thing sounds sounds like a decent idea is this a private privately funded thing is this a public funding is this a partnership how does that work so it would be it would be administered through the washington state department of agriculture um and I think initially they're looking at funding coming from the state and then hopefully as it transitions, it'll be producer supported is you know, the goal so that um, growers aren't necessarily relying on a constant infusion of tax dollars. What they're getting actually is producers saying, I will pay my registration fee of X number of dollars on an annual basis so that I can claim this Washington grown status when I'm um, selling to, you know, whether it's my neighbor, my grocery store, or, you know, the guy that's three states away. Yeah, Georgia's uh, made in Georgia. I mean, I'm, it's not not necessarily the ag product, but they have their symbol of the peach on there. And it's hard to watch a, a movie or a streaming uh, episode without a made in Georgia logo on there. So they've, they've certainly done some branding for themselves. Their, their ag branding is actually called Georgia Grown. And it still it still co-ops the peach as part of their general branding, um, and I it's it is so easily recognizable. Not dislike or not unlike um, for Washington, uh, the Tree Fruit Association does a great job with the Washington apple sticker. So you know I think maybe we're hopefully they're considering co-opting a branding that already exists. <laughs> so, sounds fun. All right. Thanks, Pam. Appreciate it.
Yeah, thanks, Dave. You bet. All right, let's uh, move on to Mark Harmsworth. He is our Center for Small Business Director. And Mark, you had uh, a blog up about Seattle, uh, King County rather, and the, the enormity of their desired spending on uh, homeless issues. Um, and yet they're leaving a key component out. Why don't we start with uh, just a, a brief synopsis of, of uh, what their approach is and how much money you know, they're seeking to spend on homelessness and how they'd get that money. And then we'll talk about what they're leaving out. Yeah, so uh, thanks for uh, hosting today, uh, Dave. It seems like we're uh, on a regular cadence here. So three weeks in a row, people are going to start talking. Um, so King County um, is uh, taking a typical big government approach. Um, their solution to the homelessness issue is to throw more money at it, uh, this time to the tune of $12 billion, with a B, dollars over the next five years. And this is one agency the um, uh, the uh, King County Homeless Authority that's asking for this money. Uh, and there's no measurable results in there either. They're just talking about throwing money at transitional um, housing or affordable housing, as they call it, um, and trying to zone for it and, and those types of things. Whereas, you know, there's many, many other solutions out there. We've talked about them a little bit over the last couple of weeks. But, but to take that kind of money, and they're seeing pushback from all sides of the agencies down there because $12 billion is a lot of money, even for Seattle, which likes to tax itself to death. Um, but, you know, many of the politicians down there and the other agencies are saying, no, this is not the right approach. And so, you know, one of the things that, that seemed you know, uh, omitted from the proposal with, I mean, it, that's an enormous amount of money. It's hard to comprehend because we, yeah. you know, we tend to think in federal terms now where there's trillions here and there, but, um, you know, that's an enormous amount of money to pour in, but left out is the tiny homes. Uh, was there a reason given for that? And, and what's your, your take on, on leaving that out when it's a less, uh, less expensive option for temporary housing? Yeah. So I don't, I just don't understand why they wouldn't consider that as a potential solution. Um, because, and, and the only thing I can put it down to is that it's the private industry that wants to help with this rather than the public industry. So it would cut into their budget. That's the only thing I can put my finger on on this. We've got projects going on all over the state, predominantly in Pierce County with um, County Executive Bruce Danmeyer, who's been pushing a project down there um, to build out a Pierce County village for tiny homes. Now, get me, don't get me wrong. There are some uh, issues with tiny homes, particularly around zoning, um, and you don't want to end up with, uh, you know, the, the 1930s Hooverville, where you've got folks that are, you know, it turns into a, an area people live there. This is a transitional space for people to get back on their feet. 21% of homeless people that were asked said if they were offered a, a, a tiny home as an option to get out of homelessness, they would take it. And so, you know, you've got private industries, you've got community um, organization, churches and, and rotaries and other organizations that want to help by providing land, but can because of the zoning regulations. Um, and if they could, there's other community members that want to get involved and, and want to build some of these tiny homes or at least have them installed because they are portable, obviously, um, and, and help them out. And if you put some rules around it, around making sure that it was transitional, it wasn't a permanent end spot, and you got community buy-in because you're going to impact the people around you. So there's some appropriate spaces you could do this and some non-appropriate spaces. Then uh, I think it's a fair solution. And even Governor Inslee is a fan of, of tiny homes. So th that's what's so shocking about the King County 12 billion proposal, not including tiny homes in there as a potential option. Yeah, I mean, to the best of my understanding, you know, uh, one tiny home uh, proposal is not necessarily the same as the next. You know, right. there's some of the key aspects you talk about are uh, some of the the rules and programs offered within, you know, requiring work uh, of some kind, some mm -hmm. uh, creating value both within within a person. Because, you know, I've said many times we talk about the homeless problem. Uh, you know, my, my own view is it's it's not as much the homeless problem as it is, you know, an individual, a brokenness problem that mm -hmm. that, uh, that that's a manifestation of. But but yeah, I mean, there are there are ways to create these things and, and make those projects, you know, projects work. Um, you know, I think Austin, Texas has, has a very a big uh, model program. Um, 
uh, from what I've read. There's a question here from, or a comment uh, rather from Alyssa. Uh, anyone see the King County Deputy Chief Community Impact Officer position, which offers unlimited vacation? Wait, I'm working for the wrong, <laughs> for the, for the wrong organization. <laughs> Wait, did you say that was King County Executive or King County what position says, there? Says, yeah. says, says King County Deputy Chief Community Impact Officer position. Oh, uh, seeing no impact. Unlimited vacation. <laughs> also states that the homeless are the best ones to come up with the solutions. So King County wants to allow them to come up with their own solutions. Totally unbelievable. Um, yeah, that, that would not yeah. make sense to me. I mean, if, you know, if I, there, are, there are aspects of this outside of homelessness. We can remove that, that issue. But there are people that you know and you encounter. It might even be yourself, you know, where you, you make a mess of things. Maybe it's your weight. Maybe it's your finances or whatever it is. And Maybe you know, it's not and then getting a haircut on time. Any of those things that, that yeah. uh, plague people like us, and then and then you know usually if if if, the, if you have a pattern of failure, you don't necessarily want to ask it yourself. That's not the expert you want to go to. You know, the one who can't fix the car is not the one you want the opinion of, right? But um, at least for me, I'd much rather just say, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna set my my own ego to the side. I'm gonna find somebody who can do this right and ask them what to do. Yeah, and I think with these tiny homes, I think you're right. It's, it's not one solution fits all. It's not the silver bullet, but it, it's it's a quiver in the in the or an arrow in the quiver, should I say? And and it's it's part of what we need to do. Again, we need we need some rules around it. You can't just do this anywhere. Um, but there's appropriate places and there's appropriate rules, like you mentioned, around, hey, you've got to be clean or at least getting into rehab if you've had an issue with drugs. Yeah, and you want to be um, progressing somebody through this housing as a transitory way. It's not the end goal into something more permanent. Let's yeah, you know, I mean, open the door. Let's let's see what happens there. Obviously, Pierce County and uh, the executive down there is working on this. Um, maybe some of the other executives in Snohomish and uh, King County predominantly could uh, consider something. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly understand why, you know, this this issue has been very big. Um, you know, in, in Pierce County, it's it's been getting bigger. I mean, Tacoma is looking more and more like Seattle every day when you're driving down the highways and some of the streets. It used to be, you know, in certain pockets. But, you know, the less the less attention is paid to, uh, to it, the faster it spreads. Uh, there's a, a park and ride uh, near that I go by from uh, on a regular basis. And, you know, there's a couple of burned out motorhomes there that people are living in, you know, and you can see it. What are the odds of that parking ride being used, by the mm -hmm. way? You know, I mean, I, I know we, we put those things there so that people commute, but I can assure you that I never see cars in there that are just commuter cars parked anymore. You used to right. see them parked there, but you, you just don't see that anymore. It's crazy. Yeah, for sure. So, I appreciate you spending your third week in a row with us, Mark. I think it makes up for you skipping, I think, the first seven, eight, nine weeks, you know, so... Oh, right. <laughs> just, just, yeah. just, ma just making up for it yeah uh, but no i, Thanks, I appreciate it it's good block appreciate it thanks so much hey everybody keep track of everything washington policy center does at washingtonpolicy.org our center directors are updating with key information about state policy uh, every day and make sure that you share that information doesn't do any good just hold it within share it with your friends and family and others and make sure that they become members of Washington uh, Policy Center. It is as low as $50 a year. So uh, a total bargain, you can go to washingtonpolicy.org and uh, there's a little donation tab um, all over the place and you can get there at uh, virtually any page on the site. And I would encourage you to be a supporter of Washington Policy Center and find people who care about policy in Washington State and make sure or, or what's going on or what's happening. Maybe they wouldn't define it as policy, but they care about, you know, the, the direction of the state. Make sure they become members as well so that they can be informed and with that information be active. Uh, this, my name is David Bowes. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next week.